pieces carved out of it, right? They have the Polish corridor here. They have the Rhineland. They have all, they've got the Sudetenland taken away to make Czechoslovakia. Um, and so the Germans essentially feel big parts of their country have been taken away and they don't like it. And Wilson's dream of the League of Nations, right? Uh, so few members are actually members, and as you, as you've seen, um, they don't have any power to punish anybody for doing anything aggressive or naughty, right? So um, when Japan invades Manchuria, uh, the League of Nations sends them a strongly worded letter saying that's not nice, don't do that. And so Japan just quits the League of Nations, problem solved. When Mussolini invades Ethiopia, the League can't even agree on sending him uh, a strongly worded letter because some of the smaller nations are afraid of uh, Mussolini turning off the oil supply that comes from the Mediterranean through Italy into Europe. So he invades Ethiopia and the League of Nations does nothing about it. So the League of Nations is useless for preventing war. Um, so they can't stop nations from fighting. They can't, remember one of the, one of the main goals after World War I was disarmament, not have these huge stockpiles of weapons. They can't stop anybody from doing that. Okay. Um, and because they don't have a military, right? The United Nations now has a military force, um, but the League of Nations didn't. So why would you do what they say? And then back to German politics. Right. This is Corporal Hitler right here, right. and there's the company dog. Uh, and you've read about this, the stab in the back theory. When World War I ended, German troops were on foreign soil on both sides of the country. They had taken land and not given it back, and that's how they keep score in a war, all right? I took your territory, you never took it back, and then they're told, that they lost. And so they begin to feel there's got to be some kind of um, conspiracy against Germany, right? And then for our first point of the day, the hand raising, uh, let me see if I get this right. Yeah. Come here. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, they, who do they, and there's more than one answer, who, who do they blame as the conspirators for selling them out. That was fast. Drew Larson. The Jews. They blame the Jews. And then there's a big overlap of Jewish representation in, in what other groups? Caitlin. Sorry, I couldn't get my mic on. Um, I think it was in the, um, hold on, give me a second. I need to think about it. You got it. One. Um, shoot, it was in the, what's, okay, I, you know what, go. You can do it, you can do it. I know what it is if I heard it, but I can't get it up, so give the point away, I'm taking too much time. Okay, <laughs> all right, we'll have someone else answer, but then you let us know if they're right, okay? Um, let's see, Sadie Stevens, where else would you, would you find a, long, a large overlap of, of Jewish people at that time? The communists or the Marxists? Right. The communists or the Marxists, right? They're, many of the leading Marxists and communists are ethnically Jewish. They're not religiously Jewish because Marxists are atheists, but they are ethnically Jewish. And what other group do they blame for this? Because they think it's controlled by Jewish communists and Marxists. Bryson. Uh, I think it's pronounced the, the water public. Uh, the the Rata Republic. Well, no, this is bigger than that. Now that that was the explicitly communist revolutionary state. Um, and like Caitlin, I can't think of their names right now. Um, anyway, um, what was the larger government that was in control of Germany? Weimar, right? So they they say, look, the Weimar government is full of communists and Jews and. They are conspiring against the fatherland, and that's why we lost the war. We didn't actually lose the war. 
Okay. And this is popular with certain movements when you lose something to say, we didn't actually lose. It was a conspiracy. All right. But there is much dissatisfaction because as you, as you know, the Versailles Treaty is very harsh. All right. And then the Weimar period, right. We get the hyperinflation. Uh, the, first, we have the Communist Revolution in Germany in 1919, 1920. Then we get the hyperinflation, uh, destitution, right? Um, and I, this, this looks like Dada, if those of you have done the art assignment, um, but it's actually a little too literal to be Dada. But it's like Dada in the sense that it's ugly. Right? It's not trying to be beautiful. So interwar art, I hope uh, if you did the extra credit assignment, um, you find it as interesting as I do. Okay, this is talented artists not wanting to make pretty pictures. So, Germany is dissatisfied for lots of reasons we've talked about. France, we skipped the chapter of France and Britain between the wars. Um, I'll cover that and then just whatever you find in your review books. Who's, well, hopefully you have a review book, by the way, because we are less than two months from the test now. And you're going to need to review Right. So France, they they don't feel as vulnerable as perhaps they should. Number one, they have the biggest army in all of Europe, way bigger than the German army. They have way more tanks than the Germans do. Okay? More of everything. And they've also built this line of permanent fortifications along the common border between Germany and France. And remember, 1871 and 1914, they fall for, you know, well, in 1871, they come right through here. 1914, the Germans do a little fake, like they're attacking here, draws a lot of French military this way, and they come into Belgium. Well, now the French say, look, we've pinned down this border. This is protected. So we only have to worry about the Germans coming this way through Belgium, and we can use our military to stop that. Okay, well, it's logical, uh, but it's not going to work for reasons we'll talk about at some point, okay? Um, so they feel falsely secure um, as Hitler begins to expand, right? But the Germans are gonna prove able to do what they did in World War I and come, you know, sort of do the end around here uh, and come in through the north of France. And, and people are, I mean, those few of you who are in World War II and stuff, uh, people are always very critical of France for letting Hitler rebuild Germany's military, reoccupy the Rhineland, uh, unify with Austria, and do all that stuff. They're like, well, if France had the biggest army in Europe. They could have stopped Hitler early on. But remember the Locarno Treaty. Remember how stupid I told you that was, right? Whichever side attacks first, France or Germany, they automatically face three nations against them. So this forces the French to be passive in their foreign policy. They don't want to attack Germany and end up facing Germany, Italy, and maybe Britain. Okay. Um, so this, this gives us a passive foreign policy, which allows Hitler to do what he wants to do. And then of course we have the Kellogg-Briand Pact, uh, which made war illegal. So I guess that's it. I guess there's no more war. And then as you know, the depression hits and it plunges the industrialized economies into depression. The more industrialized you are, the worse it hits you. So the U.S. gets hit the hardest, and then Germany and Britain. France is not as industrialized, right? It's still a lot agrarian um, and not as involved in international trade. Uh, so things aren't, it's not good times in France, but they're not hit nearly as hard as Britain, Germany, and the U.S., and so the Germans who just had their economy destroyed in 1923 now have it destroyed again in 1929. And then sort of off European topic, we get the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. And keep this in mind next year. Um, you won't talk about it much in APUS because it's, it's not really on the test that much. But um, Japanese foreign policy in the first part of the 20th century is essentially to expand their empire and get more natural resources. And there's a cold war between the U.S. and Japan, uh, essentially throughout the 1920s and 30s for control of the Pacific. And then that's going to turn hot. But the first aggressive act that Japan does is they invade Manchuria. 
which is a semi-autonomous region between Russia and China. And they go there because they want iron and nickel and the raw materials, because there's not a lot of raw materials on the Japanese home islands. And they invade, invade Manchuria. League of Nations sends them a strongly worded letter, um, and they quit the League of Nations and stay in Manchuria. And they're actually able... Um, what happens is, and we don't have time to talk about this, but the Japanese military essentially establishes a rival Japanese government in Manchuria, which they use to destabilize the Japanese elected government, and Japan becomes a military dictatorship. But that's for another class, all right? And so Japan essentially is ignoring the League of Nations, and that's going to prove a popular pastime. Italy's going to ignore the League of Nations and invade Ethiopia. Um, in that whole colonial period, only one, I don't know if we talked about this, um, only one European nation lost to the indigenous peoples it attacked and tried to conquer, and that was Italy, and it lost to the Ethiopians, okay? um, which is a great embarrassment, particularly given the racism of the time. And so Mussolini decides he wants to uh, avenge that loss and bring back the Roman Empire by conquering the poorest country in the poorest part of the poorest continent in the world. And so they uh, massacre the Ethiopians um, and, and conquer that area for essentially no reason. There's, there's nothing there of interest to Italy. Um, but again, the League of Nations does even less when they do this than Japan, than they did when Japan invaded Manchuria. And so who's watching? Well, two people are watching. Hitler's watching and Stalin is watching. Okay. Um, and so now this is, you know, Hitler, he takes power, remember, in 1934, and then Hindenburg dies. He takes power in 33. Hindenburg dies in 34. But by 36, he is the leader, right? He has the Enabling Act. They've outlawed all the other parties. So Germany is now a one-party state. And he has been semi-secretly rebuilding Germany's military way beyond what was allowed by the Versailles Treaty. And he decides, okay, I'm, I'm going to test the waters. I'm going to stick my toe in, all right? The Japanese did what they did. Mussolini did what he did. I'm going to do something and see what happens. And so he just, he puts military troops back in the Rhineland, all right? So the Rhineland is part of Germany, but it was supposed to be demilitarized. And so there's not a battle or anything. He just moves the troops into the Rhineland in direct open defiance of, excuse me, the Versailles Treaty to see what anybody's going to do. And nobody does anything about it. Right. What's happening in the U.S.? Well, throughout the 20s, and then especially when the Depression hit, the main, you know, the average person in the U.S. didn't want to be involved in Europe anymore. Why should we go to the other side of the planet, be involved in their affairs? They've been fighting and warring with each other for thousands of years. Heck, that's why our ancestors left in the first place. Okay. So uh, neutrality um, becomes an America first becomes a very popular political movement. And so much so that we get a lot of uh, members of Congress who look back to World War I and, and they realize, okay, even if the U.S. had wanted to remain neutral in World War I, we had loaned billions and billions and billions of dollars to France and Britain and only millions to the Germans. And so if, if Britain and France lost World War I, we wouldn't get our money back. And so to a large extent, we went into World War I to protect our investment and Congress doesn't want that to happen again. So they passed the Neutrality Act, which essentially makes it illegal for the US to do business with anybody who's at war, okay? Uh, and that seems like a pretty good, pretty solid plan for staying out of war. Right. And the most famous person in the world, Charles Lindbergh, uh, he is sort of the face of this isolationist movement, America first. Um, and it's very popular, especially, you know, people don't want their sons dying in Europe or somewhere else when we have the whole Western half of the planet to ourselves. So America is going to sit this one out. It looks like. And then Hitler and Mussolini they form an official alliance. Now, remember, Mussolini, he's been in power since 1922. Mussolini's the old hand, okay? And he, he thinks Hitler, and, and Hitler did to a certain extent, not by 36, but, you know, idolize him and want to do what Mussolini did. And so Mussolini thinks he's the senior partner in this, but he's absolutely not. And they form the Rome-Berlin Axis in 1936. What happens 
around an axis. We call an a something an axis because why? Mitchell. Um, because it's like a point of rotation, like everything yeah. else around it. That's right. Good job. Mrs. Tuttle got that one right too. Um, yeah. So the Earth does what around the axis? It revolves. And so this is Hitler and Mussolini saying, guess what? We're the center of things now. Things will revolve around us because we can do whatever we want and no one's going to stop us. Okay. So that's why they call themselves the axis. Um, and then they sign it in the Pact of Steel. These guys love steel, right? Stalin changed his name to Steel. So we get an official alliance. A lot of people thought it happened a lot earlier, but it didn't. It, it's 1936, Italy and Germany become allies. And then that's just in time for the Spanish Civil War. Spain, and we've seen this a lot, go all the way back to the Congress system, etc. Spain had a monarchy, unpopular monarch, so they rose up and they deposed the monarch, right? He abdicated, the king of Spain, and then we're going to have a civil war right? between uh, people who, and this is going to be reminiscent of the French Revolution, many people in Spain didn't want to be a monarchy anymore and they wanted to form a republic, right? But there are also many conservatives in Spain, including most of the leadership of the Catholic Church, who don't want a republic, which they perceive as hostile to religion and tradition. And so it's going to come to a civil war, all right? And we're going to have the National Front, right, the nationalists. And we have a group called the Carlists, who are ultra-Catholic and also monarchists, right? Remember the ultras in France? Uh, the, most of the Catholic Church itself uh, and then we're going to have an interesting party called the Falange. And on the last two reading quizzes, right, you had to know the color of Mussolini's guy's shirts and Hitler's guy's shirts. If you're going to lead a fascist movement, you've got to agree on shirt color at, like, your first meeting, okay? Because the Falange, they, they take kind of a pale green kind of shirt, okay? And they're going to be faced against a popular front or the Republicans, and this is a volatile mix, okay? This is anarcho-syndicalists, which you don't have to know. Um, but essentially, this is anarchists. And anarchy means something different than, than you maybe think it means. It doesn't mean no rules, okay? Anarchism, and it really only lives powerfully in France, okay? Everywhere else it gets subsumed by communism. Um, but essentially, if you're an anarchist, you believe in extreme local decision-making, okay? Like in Valley Center, we decide... What are the rules? What side of the road do we drive on? How much does food cost? What's the punishment for this, all right? At the extreme local level, it's kind of like a Rousseau type vision. We make our own rules at the extreme local level and there is no big over national oversight. Um, the Basques and the Catalans, right, to this day, you know, those are nationalist separatist groups that are tired of being dominated by the Spanish. And then we get communists and Marxists uh, Republicans and socialists. So there's a lot of people on this side with a lot of different ideas. And what happens when that happens? Like happened in the Russian Civil War, right? Um, that side loses. So here's some propaganda. All right, so this is two versions of the Popular Front, okay? So the Popular Front is all the anti-monarchist forces that will later become anti-fascist forces, all right? So the, you know, the popular front of Madrid is also the popular front of the world. So the whole world is, they, they're trying to promote the fact that socialists and uh, anti-fascists from all over the world are coming to help. The other view of the Republicans is this, from this fascist poster, which shows that communist Russia is controlling the Republican forces. And that's not entirely wrong. Um, Stalin infiltrates the communist movement in Spain, but he doesn't help them fight the Republic, fight the fascists so much as he just kills all rival communist leaders in the Spanish movement, okay? He'd rather have Spain be fascist than have a rival communist government. So he's actually weakening the communist side. So the Republican forces are pretty much doomed. Right? Now, initially, and when the war starts, look how much territory the Republicans have, okay? The nationalists just have a couple of tiny footholds, but ultimately they're going to prevail. 
Uh, famously, we get the Lincoln Brigade. These are Americans who volunteer uh, to fight against fascism right, uh, in Spain. Most famously, I think Ernest Hemingway is a member of that. Right? So there are, there are famous members of the Lincoln Brigade. Uh, George Orwell, who you'll learn more about. Um, he's British, but he's, he's very involved in the Spanish Civil War. Okay. And then we have this character, Generalissimo Francisco Franco. Yes. This is titles related to him. Um, he's a, he's a, just a basic conservative military monarchist general, and he's in charge of the military in Spain's sort of last remaining major colony of Morocco. All right, so if you look, okay, so right across the water, okay, we have Franco and his military. And he brings his military back to Spain uh, to fight for the conservatives, to fight for the monarchists. And he infiltrates the Falange okay, um, and takes it over. And then he puts on the uniform of fascism to try and attract support from Hitler and Mussolini. He's not really a fascist. He's an old-time conservative dictator. But he calls himself a fascist in order to get the help right, and to appear more dynamic. And he does get the help. And we get um, fascist Italy and Nazi Germany sending troops and aid to Spain. To, so, that, so the Republican forces, if you think about it, they're disorganized. Stalin is trying to gut them from within. And then Franco and Mussolini and Hitler are attacking from without. Right? They, they're doomed, even though at the beginning they held so much territory. Um, and so essentially the fascists win control of Spain. And this is the first time um, Hitler uses new weapons and new military methods. Like uh, first time we use paratroops in combat is Germans dropping into Spain, all right? Um, lots of new materials and things they want to test out on the people of Spain, uh, including massive bombing, which is very famous Picasso painting, right? And who can tell me from the assignment, uh, what school would you put Picasso in? What art school is he in? Who's already got a point today? Uh, Emily Delano. Cubism. He's a cubist, right? And you see how this is cubist, right? It's, just, it's, it's, it's shapes juxtaposed, it's jarring images. So this is his version of Germany bombing civilian targets in the town of Guernica. And so it's one of the famous atrocities, made more famous by Picasso and this painting, which appears in every world history book ever made. All right, that and Trace de Mayo are the, the two main paintings of Spanish suffering that you'll see in any Western history survey course. Yeah. And then we get the Japanese invasion of China. From Manchuria, Japan expands and uh, initiates a brutal, brutal war against the Chinese. Um, and keep that in mind as you pay attention to the news today, all right? Uh, millions of Chinese are slaughtered by the Japanese, and that affects how they think about Japan. Um, and it affects how they, the goals they have for their nation to this day, right? So there's this brutal invasion of China. And then Hitler essentially goes on a... Uh, a world tour, um, kind of in the Bismarckian fashion. Uh, and he says, look, the Treaty of Versailles separated all of us Germans. All I want is to put the Germans back together. I just want the Germans to be in one state. And a lot of people, especially like in the United States and in Britain, which is in the Depression, right? Like, well, if the Germans want to get together, whatever, fine. It's not our business. And so they vote for the union with Austria, which is called the Anschluss. All right, and uh, any Sound of Music fans there, out there? Okay, uh, who, who, who is that? Okay. Uh, well, okay, Mitchell and Sadie. Yeah, so that's the drama at the end there when the Von Trapps have to dip to the hills, right, because the Nazis are taking over. So um, they were going to have a vote uh, to determine whether or not Austria would join with, with Germany and Hitler decided that he wasn't going to wait for the results of the vote. And so he invades Austria um, with the support of Austrian Nazis. Um, and Austria becomes part of Germany. 
Right? And then all the Austrian Nazis are killed by the German Nazis. Just like Stalin kills any rival communists, the first people that fascists kill are rival fascists. Right? So Franco killed Jose Antonio, who was the leader of the Falange. Um, so essentially, they are ruthless in eliminating political opposition. Okay? So if you look at this map, Austria now is joined with Germany. And that happens when no one does anything about it. And so then Hitler says, oh, you know what? There's another place where there's a whole bunch of Germans, and that is this sort of C-shaped area that makes up the boundaries of the last remaining democratic state in Europe, Czechoslovakia. And Hitler says, look, all these Germans here, they're, they're being um, harassed and bullied by the Bohemians, right, by the Czechs. And so I just want to add them in, uh, make them part of Germany. I'm just putting Germany back for Germans, all right? Well, Czechoslovakia says, well, first of all, Hitler's lying. We're not abusing the people, right? But he has, you know, Hitler has a great fake news machine, and he organizes these instances of German maidens being violated by vile Bohemians and things. Um, and Czechoslovakia says, you know, if, if you give away this part of our country, uh, we're going to lose most of our industry, and there's a mountain range right here that's our only natural defense against Hitler. Um, so essentially, if you, if you allow Hitler to take this, we probably won't exist anymore as a country. Mm -hmm. And so this is called a problem. This is an international problem. So what do you do when you have a problem? You call a meeting, right? And so they call a meeting in Munich, okay, the Munich Conference. Right? And the Munich Conference, essentially, in, I have other pictures of this, I, I show, but you have Hitler, and you have Mussolini, and you have Deladier from France, and you have uh, Neville Chamberlain from Britain. And they're going to decide what to do about Czechoslovakia. Who's not invited? Who, who did not get invited to the Czechoslovakia conference? Kylie. Czechoslovakia? Yeah, they didn't invite Czechoslovakia because, you know, they're just going to be a bummer. They're going to object to um, what we want to do. So we're not going to invite them. And so we get the Munich Agreement. And Hitler, pinky promises, if you give me the Sudetenland and let me put all the Germans back together again, that's it. I'm done. I'm good. I'm not going to ask for anything else. You won't hear from me again. We'll just be a bunch of happy Germans. And so Chamberlain, um, who had never flown on a plane before, he flies back and forth between Munich and London like 17 times um, to try and get this thing done. And he gets off the plane famously and waves that document and says, look, Hitler has promised that if we do this, he's not going to pursue war. This foreign policy is called appeasement. Okay? And what's happening? Britain is so debilitated by the Depression and by their debt from the First World War, and so is France, and they know the U.S. is not going to get involved. They're hoping, look, if we just give him what he wants, we won't have to go to war. Right? They're trying to avoid war by giving in to Hitler's bullying, which I'm sure you know well enough that doesn't work. Right? Um, but they feel desperate enough that they feel they have no choice. They feel they, they can't possibly support another continental war at this point. So if we just give Hitler this, maybe he'll go away. Well, he doesn't. And early on in 1939, uh, Hitler invades the rest of Czechoslovakia and conquers it. And Britain and France now realize, oh, all right, we messed up. This isn't going to work. Um, but they can't do anything about it. It's already been done. Right. And so essentially what they do is they they basically they double down on to the largest country created by the Versailles Treaty in Central Europe, Poland. And they say, look, we got you no matter what. Remember the little entente where France tries to replace its alliance with Russia with other countries in Central Europe? Well, Poland's the biggest one of those. And the French and the British say, we, we guarantee we promise we're, you know, if Hitler tries anything against you, then it's war. And so we're at that point when this bombshell drops, and that is the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact, or if that's not 
a mouthful enough. It's the Molotov von Ribbentrop Pact. And remember, I said Stalin's also watching. Stalin's watched what Japan's doing. He's watched what Mussolini's doing. He's watched what Hitler's doing. All right. And none of the Western powers are doing anything about it. And remember, Stalin, Russia's been invaded by Germany within the last 30 years. So he feels, I'm going to have to make a deal with Hitler himself um, because the Western powers aren't going to protect me at all. Otherwise, I'll be in a war with Germany. And so we get the Nazi Soviet non aggression pact. Okay? And this is Molotov. This is a fascinating guy. Survives all of Stalin's purges and things like that. There's Stalin. Right? Um, there is, that's actually not, this is von Ribbentrop right here, uh, the Nazi foreign minister. And they agree not to get in a war with each other because they realize if we agree not to fight each other, we can take all of Central Europe and no one can stop us, right? We can, we can basically have our two empires meet in the middle. Russia can get back everything they lost in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Hitler can get everything back that Germany lost in the Versailles Treaty. And as long as they agree not to go to war with each other, no one can stop them. And so they sign this agreement, and it specifically spells out who gets what parts of Poland. And having this agreement in his pocket, um, knowing, excuse me, that he, he won't risk war with Stalin until he's ready for it. Hitler invades Poland and uh, France and Britain finally make good on their promise. And they say, okay, no more appeasement. We have no choice. And they declare war on Germany. And World War II begins. Okay, officially September 1939, when the Germans invade Poland, is your official start. Even though all this other stuff's been going on, we officially call it World War II starting in September 1939. And remember, the U.S. doesn't get involved until December 1941. All right, so almost two years, right, or more than two, more than two years into the war. So a lot of stuff's going to happen before the stuff that we hear about. All right, so that's the road to war.